Hello everyone, today we talk about Romano-Germanic government, essentially the development of an administrative apparatus, its um, agents, uh, functionaries, um, through this, say, between the 5th to the 11th century, right, so there is initially actually a, a moment of contraction, of shrinking, and then a, a gradual recovery with the development of mostly like a, a Basilotic beneficiary it's really clientary system, as it had always been happening, even in Roman times, but in a much more decentralized and privatized way than it had been before. Yet, uh, at the end of this period, and that's actually during the 12th, 13th century, with the affirmation of true feudal uh, states, uh, not just monarchies per se. Um, so, the Romano Germanic background here is key to, of course, a specific type of background in a specific time of development I have completely random uh, way uh, another video ca coming about the Romano Germanic uh, military uh, development and uh, we will be seeing how these topics of course overlap right so today we deal with the civil side of the story even though there wasn't much of a difference as, as we will See now, like in a um, in a in a personal sense. Then eventually, yes, the, juridically and say structurally, there is definitely a state developing, which is a necessity. And one of the things we tend to overlook is also how, after all, few, but also large, the Latin Germanic kingdoms, right? For real, really were. Today, we do not talk too much about the Anglo Saxons, for example. But when it comes to, for example, the, the Frankish or the Longbert um, or the more short-lived Gothic um, states, we, we, of course, are look in some cases here actually overlap, like in, in the continuity, you know, chronologically. But we are looking at, in fact, um, a substantial um, administrative system, uh, substantial power concentration right, to original level, and we'll surely also cover these things a bit more in depth for the, for the single countries. So, between the 5th and the 7th century, um, you have, indeed, um, quite similar, but also relatively uh, varied experience of monarchic and statal um, systems, in the Romano-Germanic system. When we talk about the Romano-Germanic system, ethnically speaking, here we, we are referring to the, essentially the, uh, the, the western half of the uh, Roman Empire, right? the affirmation of uh, first the, the nuclei of Federati and eventually the takeover by entire groups right, of peoples, like, uh, establishing in a, in a national sense individual kingdoms. Right, so there were from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of, of mostly Germanic populations settling in this um, pretty, you know, large and deeply populated, after all, like in comparison to, to other areas of Europe, especially also the ones from which these groups were coming from, that had been the single most not just Romanized, but properly Latinized uh, lands in the West, right? In, in the East, you find, of course, um, what is mostly uh, narrated as, uh, you know, it was such a great state that survived the migration here, whatever, and so uh, much of that sort of positive bias lays in the fact that we tend to essentially picture the West like being disintegrated in its civilization or whatever by the Germanic invasion, uh, as a matter of fact, it's hardly uh, the case. If anything, it's a very strong synthesis and um, and uh, actually strengthening of the of of the West and um, Roman help, like under the government of these Germanic peoples, um, that really provide with us st an unprecedented stability. At least if we look at the last. Uh, the last generations in, in Western Roman history realized that eventually, even just by the admission of the of the Romans, was a 
uh, finally some power concentration. This happened in different ways, right? And these countries, again, have all their peculiarities, but it's important to observe um, this dynamic greatly in the in the concept of Germanic leadership, but also of continuity of the Roman administration, which is always overlooked. There is a general shrinking of the system by the mid 16th century, which encompasses basically all of Eurasia. Right? This is not about the West falling or you know whatever. It happens exactly in the same way everywhere, um, at least in the in the measure by which this contraction um, uh, manifested in relative terms to the local uh, dynamics. Um, you have a mostly initial concept of Germanic military and Roman civile uh, system, like in function. This, again, does not happen everywhere by the same measure. Um, we can approximately say that the uh, these centuries are essentially the, a moment of tr passage from the institutional and administrative system of the empire to one that um, of the uh, complex Roman organization and state, in fact, left uh, space for much simpler forms of government, which is not a positive thing, meaning that uh, even though the Roman Empire was unbalanced in, in some um, political and social essentials, and it, this is greatly the cause of, of its own of its own fall, still the Germanic rulers were trying to salvage as much as possible of that very system in the same measures, right? So the way eventually, possibly for the better, at least I'm convinced of that, but in on the shorter run, being objectively negative, right? Uh, there is nothing, no free of freeing of, you know, the, you know, the improvement of the uh, of quality of life or whatever, all this kind of stuff. It's actually a disastrous uh, process for all involved, meaning this did not come from, say, the benefit of one side, of one people, whatever. This was, again, at large, a dynamic that leveled the situation for everyone. And that left, at least until the end of the migration era, many sort of question marks open because there could be other peoples on the move. This was the the main problem, even for the the earliest um, Germanic uh, kingdoms that were settled in the uh, in the West. Um, what I was saying before is that the Latin part of the empire had had a much more capillary, intimate, and um, uh, if you want even preparative mechanism in the um, you know in the for for re the relation between uh so a concept of public and one of so of privacy that could cooperate at the same time right the idea that that lays at, at the heart of the west which essentially is a, is a strong dialogue between the the temporal and the spiritual authority that would mark in fact the say the the heart of of the Western Middle Ages, it's something we stop uh, chronologically to today, is fundamentally stemming from what the Romans had managed to achieve, differently from the Greeks in the East, that are sort of more conservative um, in the in the essentials of their of their culture, their civilization, but fundamentally in a sclerotic way, it does not manage to simply Hellenize, um, for example, the interland of the empire just remains based on this very solid urban coastal um, um, reality uh, and that the, the West and, and that corresponds in, in the Byzantine political and social model in the continuity of that Roman system that had sort of sclerotized right with the idea for example of the convergence of the temporal and spiritual power in the figure of the emperor whereas in the West we have the um, essentially the di the continuous dialogue we were just talking about uh, the other day for the 7th century 
Irish ecclesiastical hierarchy, among the, other, the various things, of a spiritual power universally uh, in a temporal one that in this first, um, the latter of which in this first century is actually missing. The, the Roman papacy, even way half of a millennium before the establishment of the papal monarchy, is already recognized uh, within this, especially like Italy, Gaul, and Britain, right? And uh, aside from from Spain, Spain had it's more it was more uh, relying in a sort of national sense on the councils of Toledo that were imitating Constantinople in the in the ambitions of let's say of sorts of political and social order. This, um, at least in our religious ways and unparalleled in the West, there is this axis again running north, west, south, east from Britain, Gaul, Italy. Uh, in Italy, as we will see now, the Ostrogoths had tried to maintain a bit that order, right, of late antique character. But even there, with a significant relation already with the papacy, was extremely different from the one that the Byzantine emperors had with the patriarchs and with the same Roman Pope that they would never manage to, to either suppress or intim intimidate effectively. Um, why, in fact, was essentially Germanized the spiritual superiority of the Latin Germanic um, world. So it, it's it's um it's a, a very important passage, and we'll have to come back on that. Right. But today we focus on the state, and so the fact that um, essentially the Roman bu building had been essentially w worn out by by itself to a degree had been taken hit by all the, the invasions, much of which also successfully repelled by the same Romano-Germanic alliance. Think about the Huns, right, and the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, and what that really meant. Um, I made recently some videos about the late Roman army, we'll come back on that, of course. Um, so, the most virtuous model in the first era is the one that we, we just uh, remember. It was the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Theodoric, in the Italian peninsula, uh, which is the by far the best example of cooperation between the Romans and the Germans, right, in terms of uh, reciprocal tolerance and integration. Of course, at the end of the period, uh, there are internal strifes that are not much connected between, the, ethnically speaking, but with the address that the monarchy would have had to take, either something, something more, in fact, Byzantine in character or more sort of uh, privatized. Um, that actually triggers the the Byzantine reconquest of the West. It had as its first objective, of course, the Italian peninsula itself, for for the obvious reason that a Roman Empire must rule over Rome in, in the first place. Um, and Theodoric's Italy is very interesting. We'll have to come back um, on it, make some videos here and there, but it's really a, a marvelous chapter also because of the sort of international relations that it managed to maintain with this sort of, not just the Gothic uh, part of Europe, so essentially Spain and Italy, but also Central Europe. Um, so an Aryan and still pagan, uh, but not because of some you know attempt to repaganize the system, actually, um, as the, the, the ones controlled by the Goths were by far the most irreversibly Catholic lands. Um, of of uh, of of the empire actually because the Byzantines were already dealing with some heretical issues uh, in in the east, uh, but especially against the emergence of the Franks in the northwest, they were actually not that more Romanized or or uh, Christianized people, right? Uh, than the Goths, uh, especially that were the most instead. But that made this great choice under Merovingian leadership to skip the Aryan. Part they converting formal at least as elites with the alliance of the Gallo Romans to uh, to Catholicism, and that uh, were um, a power to be reckoned with. Um, one that after the collapse of the Gothic system, at least in Italy, it was sort of the leading one also for the Iberian Peninsula, um, brought the Byzantines to try to, in an Atlantic perspective, to contain the same Frankish power, which is the same one that will return in Charlemagne's time, knocking. Uh, at the door in Italy that in the meanwhile, as you know, had been taken over by the Longbirds, right? So in Ostrogothic Italy, what you have, speaking of government, um, 
and in the provinces, because it wasn't just Italy, as you know, it reached Germany, the Danube, it had parts of Illyria, it had Provence, it, uh, you know, it had this sort of broader hegemonically, um, you know, uh, positive uh, role, in, especially in the, again, in, in the Latin Germanic Christendom, as it was consolidating as a, as a specific cultural uh, area. Um, you have, um, uh, in fact, even the same connections between the between Ravenna and and uh, the frontier, like the, the 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 provinces proper, substantially intact. All right, there is a consistorium in Ravenna in which the Germanic chieftains sit next to the Roman senators. They manage to to continue like all the administrative affairs. The Germans take over the they are they are the military themselves, um, while the Romans run the the civil system like it had always been, um, and the king naturally was the the center for the you know of the authority at least ideally acting on behalf of of Constantinople that had sent him there but that now especially you know the gods in Italy were legitimately seeing as a power on their own, right? One that could, if anything, parallel the Byzantine one, as we were saying, also for the Visigoths later on. Um, and uh, the strongest tendency, however, would um, be observed even within uh, Ostrogothic Italy, that is the one of the essentially disappearance of the tax system, right? Essentially, we've seen it also for the individual about the late Roman army, everything worked as long as there was a state that could uh, levy enough taxes to have a functional army. Right? Th this was the point. The other alternative was, and we're talking an army, we're talking about, um, you know, A plus, you know, level of, you know, performance and quality, etc. The alternative being the system, the structure in itself, you know, still you know, re relatively powerful one. This is evident in, uh, for example, in, mostly in Gaul, where it was um, about the Merovingians, in spite of the unitary and imperial um, control of the dynasty, much more decentralized and already sort of proto-feudal one, um, in which there were some advantages, um, including the fact that um, you could, in fact, in invest your you know, you could trigger some military expansion by infelfing, let's say, the, the your own your own military and their leaders into some external territories. Like in that case, it would be Aquitaine that was stripped from the from the Visigoths and Burgundy, uh, Alamannia, those are peoples that were properly crushed by the Franks, and in a time in which these were still dangerous, so they they would have had to fight them anyway. Um, and yet maintaining sort of less direct control of the entire system. Um, the Goths, in, t in that sense, ma maintained Romanity, standing as much as they could. We've seen in some videos about the Visigoths how in Spain, too, this, where there is no destruction of the king, at least until the Islamic invasions, there is also a wearing out of the system. And the, the, the same Roman one where the Latifundium had been maintained, this is true for for Gaul, for Spain specifically. It's true also for Italy, at, at least until the Byzantine reconquest that paradoxically destroys um, uh, because of the war itself, that system, and the Longobards take over. And so th there is this very interesting meeting for essentially the, the Italians being liberated by the the, the colonial, sort of the, the, the latifundium uh, uh, serfdoms in, in some ways, and the, which in terms of individual per capita wealth, sort of paralleled the the Germanic ideal that the Longobards were bringing in terms of more individual liberty, as at least they had experienced it in the barbaric and without being um, oligarchized, let's say, in the Gothic way by the Byzantines. I mean, the, the Goths had been literally created as political, as kingdoms um, by the Romans, right? They, they did not exist before, so... Um, and uh, in that sense, maintaining a, a profile, in fact, was unknown even in Gaul, right? It's more similar to the Anglo-Saxon one, except 
Britain had lost too much like of, of the Roman system compared to Italy. So these countries are similar, especially in this sort of most leveled, leveled moment. But they develop in very different ways, at least. Um, England will take forever, let's just like to develop into something more uh, unitary and public and, you know, um, and uh, it, it, it's a long story, whereas more or less Italy always remained a functional uh, kingdom under the, the gods, the Longobards, the Franks. Things worked in publicly and civilly in pretty, pretty consistent ways. And in fact, again, we, as, as I said at the beginning, that's what we see today, like the Franks and the Longobards mostly. And then we get into the seigneurial post carlingian phase that we have covered already pretty often, right? Um, so this um, tendency of loosening of, of the system, like also in terms of the control, the coordination between center and periphery, the privatization, the um, subcontracting of the unitary institu institutional apparatuses is sort of more common in, in the broader Latin Germanic world. Um, public life was organized on a ever more adherent, let's say, on, on a basis of ever more adherent on the reality of a fragmented Germanic settlement uh, within this um, tribal and military communities that they were right before, like after having sojourned in the barbaric and that sometimes was technically even within the, the same Roman frontiers. I mean, think about the Balkan interland for the gods, right? That was not definitely Greece, the, the Aegean, as, as such. Um, and that, in fact, would do, even for, especially for the army. And on our side, um, so this favoring, given that the Germans were at least initially, in, let's say, in, a, in an ethnic sense, in charge, right, politically, juridically, um, on our side, the rest of the population were the Romans, right? So properly, again, this essentially civilly organized um, culture that still was materially like running the what 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 had been salvaged from the deterioration of public institutions that would in fact also acculturate the Germans that start in fact legislating in Latin and essentially merging with the with the Romans also at a juridical level de facto um, with the Germanization the, the I made a video specifically about this like the, the identity read juridically Germanization of the Romans Right, this is very like this happens all over the West. Right in the West, you do not find, aside from a few Byzantine islands like Romans that are recognized as such juridically after you know, at least in a consistent numerical way, after a couple of generations after the Germanic settlement. Um, naturally, there was no such thing like an ethnic substitution or a thing that the Germans were just a few points percentage of the, the rest of, of the population on regular, especially in countries like probably Southern Europe, right? It was the most populated. In countries like, for example, in Northern Gaul, there were substantially more. Like in, in, in Britain, you do have the Anglo-Saxons really coming en masse, in, especially in relative terms of the population had remained in Britain, so there is a more ethnic impact. That's the reason why, um, why you know, uh, England speaks uh, English and not uh, a Romance language, right? Aside from the fact that this was already uh, the least Romanized part of the West, right? So differently from practical, the, the, the rest of the Western half um, Roman Empire as a linguistical outcome, all right? Um, so I could digress and we will surely do this in other videos on the degree by which so politically that Germanic fragmentation in the moment of the settlement in the further um, uh, agglutination of these realms etc model to various countries um, the, I made a video about the tribal hide age for the for the Anglo-Saxons, but 
it's interesting also for our talk. I did make some videos already on the settlement of, of all these various peoples in, in the western half of the Roman Empire, so you can start from those if you're interested and you haven't checked them out already. So in the Romano-Germanic kingdoms that survived the Byzantine reconquest and later the Islamic invasions, so we're talking essentially the Frankish one and the new Longobard uh, dominion in Italy, after the 7th century, um, we witness a moment of profound transformation of royal power. Right? We witness actually a stabilization. The 7th century is sort of the darkest part of say, the, the dark, in the so-called dark ages, um, after which things actually start rising uh, again. Right? And also relatively quickly for the times and places potential. All right, the Senate, maybe it's not that dynamic, but already from the mid eight you see like a very strong push, especially in these very areas, like especially northern Gaul, northern Italy. Um, and much of this mechanism stems from the, let's say, the evolution from a simple military coordination, say we are all ethnic, whatever, Franks, Longobards, whatever, um, towards it that have just conquered this territory that was something new, because the Germans didn't technically know this concept, this association between like a, a uniform government over a certain amount of land that responds to a single leader. Before, they were all clans sort of settled in a different way, and they were just grouped by some loser ethnic ties. They elected every once in a while a leader, but again, Germanic kingship is something affirmed, like, you know, in the, in the way we intend, like, uh, historically, dynastically, territorially, by the, 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 the times of Alaric, and so essentially as Roman federati, right? That's how the so-called what would have called would have been later called the Visigoths were born as a political reality. They were essentially the Roman army of Illyricum, right? Their Rex was the the leader that that was substituted before. There was a Roman army that Constantinople uh, settles the Germans there, and uh, that's the key point. We've seen it. That there is an anona. There is a tax collection system. Something with, that within the empire was possible, and that these peoples as long as they had remained outside of it, had not had properly the, the, the means of, of, of establishing. And so uh, this is the, the actual evolution of, of a monarchy to, with a tendentially territorial character, right? For some, actually for all these people, it's, it's sort of immediate in the moment in which they settle in, in the Roman territory. What, what, mostly creates problems of how to organize further, like how to pass from the clans to the single monarchy, right? But territorially speaking, like it's or already on the basis of the Roman provinces, of the local infrastructure, the, the general international situation, that at least that broader people, the, the Franks, the Anglo-Saxons, the, the Visigoths, the, the Longobards are there, like they're in that regional um, they manage that of course it would be silly not to develop into an actual state into an actual kingdom and that in fact what unavoidably happens because again the Germans were obviously seeking to attain this and to especially preserve anything that that, that in that direction could could do from from the Roman uh, past um, and needless to say this works especially in the most Romanized areas right it's not a it's not a coincidence uh, this aside from the well, okay, let's not talk about this. But I mean, it's paradoxical that some of the most genuinely Germanic institutions are affirmed in the single most Roman countries of of these, right? Which does not in, entail a, a, uh, an alteration of what happened locally, but on the contrary, the the synthesis of the two systems, because those were strong, all right? Together, that, that's the actual outcome we see. Um, and so this concept entails, of course, an authority that could be exercised on all the members of the community. Also, in, regardless of the ethnic origins, right? Um, as we were saying before, the, the tendency would be to, obviously, to the juridical homogenization 
of the ethnic identity, which was what was the actual the on, only indicator that they had that say that that they could um use in order to put in relation to the central authority right um and that as we've seen tends to to germanize uh, everyone right even if these people again spoke in the same germans uh, began to, to, to the same kings this etc essentially became to, to began to, to speak romance themselves now um this power had on the um say was was based mostly in, in a concrete sense on the possession of large very large quotas of the former domain right so the public land um of the empire that in many ways had been forfeited again to the to the great senators the, now the, the great noblemen if these estates had been maintained intact what was the great ch- the challenge during the migration year but, but especially during the the wars that happened within, within these territories again Gaul, Spain they, they had suffered some ravages but the, I mean the, the things had deteriorated but essentially the the estates remained there right that's why these are also paradoxically more unstable systems initially in a in a public sense because everything is much more privatized like the state sort of operates in between this oligarchic bases um, before the Roman senators had kept it together because the empire was a, an overarching authority keeping them together. Now that that thing does not exist anymore, so every chunk, like in the Merovingian kingdom, like that is split in f- into four by the end of, of the seventh century, or the various sort of centrifugal pushes in in the Hispanic one, for example, of the Visigoths, are quite eloquent. For example, Italy is much tidier uh, in this under the Longobards. Um, the same goes for the Anglo-Saxons because they really rebuilt from scratch, you can, or to at least from from smaller bases, right? That had to come together without having large private oligarchic bases to start from, um, because they had evaporated, right? Um, so. Mm, what in in the different degree that we described to us right now you have to imagine like the the challenge posed in establishing an administration that um could allow primarily like this is the, the point of it all having a force that defends uh the people right it, it's a reason of it's military reasons of defense all offense as well but to to maintain the political control in this territory, right, and being, make it autonomous and unitary in its international uh, role, right, um, without state you can't have that, so we have seen also the last video I made on the western um, Roman army, for example, how there had been a, um, you know, the, the passage from, um, Say that there much had been inherited from the Roman tradition in terms of the vocation to exercise a more pervasive authority. This is true also for the military. At some point, uh, especially in Gaul, you have entire units, Roman units, that uh, had just been there historically that are simply absorbed by the uh, by the, the local military system. These communities live on for generations being uh, say indicated as uh, you know Romans and participating to the to the Frankish army, right? For example, um, and vice versa. At some point, for example, in the Byzantine areas, think about I don't know the the Vandals in Africa, right? And after the the reconquest, these guys had been partly had been killed, others had been deported, but others, especially in the frontier, had been maintained. This is true also for Italy. In the north, there are Ostrogothic um, garrisons that remain even after the Gothic War and eventually are uh, absorbed, subsumed by the Longobards that are right. Uh, losing their ethnic identity, meaning becoming Longobards and not Gothic anymore, even though they were still so, sort of different. Uh, sometimes some Longobard um, groups were still maintaining uh, some, I don't know, Franconian or Swabian identity, because of course this were, had been sort of originally quite diverse groups. 
you know, even maintaining ties with the original lands at some point, but eventually, like, these chunks remaining, you see, also at the basis of more or less the, the today's um, regional, regional boundaries that were conceived unitarily uh, since, since that time, in spite of how eventually politics could, could, could go in, in other directions, and would go in other directions, you know, for example, the feudalization of the system, etc. It's another story. It's still the state, the idea of a Romano-Germanic public authority, uh, in theory controlling everything within this territory, as a box, right, just handled by the king, is never cancelled. It, it juridically and territorially, like in theory, the king has that absolute power, in theory. Right? And, and during the Middle Ages, as you know, and up to, again, the, the 18th or even the 20th century, everything is very different in practice, um, and even institutionally, but still, like, those, like, even in Roman times, like, when you look at Gaul, you look at Spain, you look at Britain, you look at Italy, but those are essentially, like, the countries you see today, in a broader sense. Um, so... Um, all this meant, of course, uh, this revival right, of, of force, right? A necessity of government, which um, was sustan- substantiated, aside from broader political dynamics, in the apparatus of royal agents that, doesn't matter how rudimentarily uh, looking at the time, was capable of providing and representing within the different areas of the realm, the patrimonial interests of the king had exercised um, that sort of, you know, core of values of contents that the Roman and the Germanic traditions had conferred to the same. So properly, properly this concept of public, absolute, universal authority. So these guys were invested with those faculties, like you are the king's agent. You know, this is very important, right? In theory, so you have the same... And again, the, the ways this would socially overlap with single, I don't know, noble man, or how this would also take at some point in history to send more uh, middle class sort of nature, like the bourgeoisie from the 13th century. Like, it, it's a, it's another story, right? But uh, you do need these agents. In, in the very early times, there were... We know that from from the names, like Romans, right? Latin names at court uh, in the administration of the otherwise like the Germanic ruled system, because these were the guys that still, for example, that knew how, had know how to write, how to compile the legal codes that the same Germans now were issuing for for the kingdom. Um, they had this. These guys had been, of course, particularly important. They had of course, as we were saying, just Germanized themselves and had entered part of the aristocracy and whatever. So there is an important continuity in all that. It happens at different levels in different places. Um, you know, think about the Gallo-Roman bishops of Gaul or, say, the, the municipal gentry of, of the Italian cities. So that that's all something which um, depends from land to land. But overall, right, you needed these guys uh, to with different powers, uh, of course, relative to circumstances, that could confer, it could exercise things like you know the protection over the weak, right, the maintenance of peace, right. You have to be the police in many ways. That you have to guarantee justice, uh, the organization of the exercitus of the army, right, for the defense and the, and the military expeditions. And again, I, I will make an entire video dedicated to this. Soon, it's a sort of parallel of this one. Um, this means, of course, that such agents must be connected with the territory, with the communities, uh, and must have some form of representatives, which was in part what we were saying before, this more privatized, decentralized one that looks a bit like already feudal to some degree. Um, and these were not just single agents, but real, you know... Um, in fact, governors, right, at a provincial level, or the strict level, that we, uh, with, with a hierarchy within within the kingdom. Um, 
for example, within the longer bird one, you have some king's agents known as the Gastaldi that were born as some, um, in fact, literally like representatives of the king next to the traditional nobility, right, of the Germanic chieftains that had traditionally maintained the responsibility of the community of men, uh, men in, uh, at, uh, in arms, right, the, we're talking the dukes in the Longobard kingdom, the Franks had the, the counts historically, the French choices, right, uh, that corresponded in origin to sort of different tendencies. Paradoxically, the, the, the Frankish one a bit more Roman, right, due to the, in fact, properly, like, strong Gallo-Roman Sostratum in Gaul, whereas the Longobards had not met with uh, much of a progress administration after the Gothic War had sort of weakened and destroyed, so they reti retained their military, like, ducal mm, character. This, of course, bo both titles are used in, in the Roman army, right, but it, the, the, the count is by far more common within the in fact, within the, the Roman reality, so that you, you encounter it just in cases with slight in areas that had been originally uh, more Romanized, like the Duchy of Benevent, right? But it's just like a secondary office. Um, and the, the Gastals are important because initially they just are sent into the various duchies to to side with the, the, the dukes, mostly in a not necessarily in a competitive way, but essentially as the um, like we endowed with some palaces, with some lands, but essentially as a point of reference for every subject to go uh, there to to them and manifest any you know request. It was mostly a demand for justice that mostly involved like the, the shortcomings of, of the abuses of the ducal government, right? So since the Longobard dukes are not hereditary uh, in office, um, sometimes these ducal houses die out and the Gastald takes over um, by the king's order, right? And in fact, in sort of the most, um, like in the core of the Longobard kingdom is fundamentally Lombardy in Tuscany, uh, you have a, a much greater... Say control of of the of the kings and uh, much greater administrative homogeneity where the Gastals have basically maintained uh, this uh, you know the, the control, like, but also with much more actual um, power sharing. But say in terms of individual well-being of of the, of the, the liberties of of the of the individuals, right? In, in a more again urban civil context. In the Frankish kingdom you see a more hierarchical form, especially uh, a, a greater uh, scale in terms of territorial control because of the essentially the, the, the concentration of enormous amounts of wealth in the hands of very few people uh, for the, the aforementioned reason that this era had essentially not been destructured from Roman times, the the Roman estates passed in the hands of the Frankish noblemen that, you know, if you think about the French uh, nobility, like you have an idea of what the mentality really was in that regard. And that were were much more warlike because essentially they were so strong that they, they made justice just with a sword and the Franks did only that, right? They, they were incredibly rough and sort of, again, that swords, lands and, and horses, that's all that they care about fundamentally. Um, but this also produces greater forms of coordination that are at the basis, for example, I made a bit about the 8th century Carolingian cavalry, how the, so the, the, Frank, the Carolingian military machine was put together, in term, of course, from mechanisms that already existed just in Merovingian times. Um, in terms of the connection, the links, the cooperation be between all these various warlords, like in their ma increasingly mounted military clientels, Right, and this was also in part favored by the territory. I mean, you have this vast, but I mean really vast, Atlantic plains stretching from the Pyrenees to the Rhine that are massively um, fertile, right? Think about the, the Atlantic 
current the just like the fat soil especially of france it's the, the real cradle the, the hub of frankish military powers is, is now straight essentially northeastern france today and in fact, around which in fact the so the, the french state would, would develop from we made lots of videos historically observing this through, through the various ages it, it, it hadn't began at that point um Areas that in Roman times had not been particularly developed, but that had an important military inclination, like great part of the logistical supply system that, for example, had served the the largest Roman legionary concentration on the Rhine, which had been inherited by the Franks. In Neustrian, this sort of crescent, right, from Brittany to the Alps. Um, well, that Neustria was technically not exactly, it was, there were also other parts, uh, but that was the, the center of Frankish power, so strategically, like they could launch offensives into uh, in far further east, they could control the Alpine passes, where they these guys were the strongest, they had the upper hand. Um, and again, this the greatest um, demographic and agricultural concentration um, under a single rule that again would break down into these various chunks that were controlled by different branches of the, of the same uh, royal family and whatever, but that were in this sense habituated to be, to acting as individual chunks to sort of regroup and to eventually boom into things like, you know, the, the Carolingian Empire, all right? Um, so this, um, as you know, the Franks had their own mayors of, of, of palace that were born as, as uh, um, like a court, court officials, and that would be so powerful themselves to at some point substitute themselves to the same it's only partially right the idea of the roi fenelon is a bit too excessive like to, to the to the same kings um and so between the 7th and the 8th century i made some videos about this we will come back on it there is a playlist on the merovingians on the, the carolingians etc they, they overlap of course um you have the affirmation of the pepinid arnulfingian and later Carolingian as the same family dynasty reaching um, the I mean uh, the, the royal uh, crown because of the, the alliance with the Pope that allows also the dynastic substitution to the to the Merovingians and that in fact in its new Romanity acquire a imperial dignity Right, and this is not the video in which I explain why that was a real deal, not a not a fiction in terms both of, of empire and romanity, especially. Um, in any case, you know that this system absorbs the same Longobard kingdom, right? It stretches its authority on this pretty vast, sort of really frontier and boundless, uh, you know, central European area. Um, with the final conquest of, let's say, the, of Germany, what had been sort of with the Slavic migration sh shrunk a little bit in size in the east, but up to the Elbe, fundamentally, and going down up to the Pannonian Plain, crushing the other Kaganate, I mean, becoming really a, um, uh, an imperial uh, might to be reckoned with, um, which poses, in fact, new governmental reasons, because the Carolingian emperors had to confront now the, the, with the problem of governing an, an extremely extended territorial area that was much variegated also in terms of original traditions. Um, this was the sort of greatest problem, especially of the most enlightened Carolingian rulers, or at least those who were had been lucky enough not to, you know, to, to see their to see their brothers dying, and so all power being concentrated into their hands because the Franks never gave up that ultimately detrimental, uh, detrimental mentality of splitting the, the inheritance equally right among all the various uh, males uh, for which there may have not been a Carolingian Empire even at some point. So we're talking about Charlemagne and Louis de Pius that have to deal with the the awareness of course that the Franks had never had practically any trace of public um, 
civil education whatsoever. Their power was founded mentally and culturally at an incredibly deep as violent level on private and military identity. They thought that whatever they could grab was theirs as single people, right? They did not understand the idea of, of, a, of a state or something above them, all right? And it was quite complicated to, especially after the, the empire sort of overstretched or at least reached its, its, say, you know, political, strategical, and logistical sense, its sort of um, largest boundaries, to now build something from the within because, you know, the, the loot... Uh, the slaves, etc., from, from other people had ended, and what would happen, in fact, uh, these rulers wouldn't succeed, is that the system ate itself alive, right? The, the disgregation of Carolingian Empire is not due to external invasions, whatever, that were just a consequence of the Frankish uh, auto, um, you know, priv again, privatization and fragmentation of local bases. Um, one great mean to achieve, however, some level of stability was the spread of the church, of the ecclesiastical administration, which was not hereditary, even though the clergy was all coming from, especially in France, like in, in yeah, among the Franks from from noble families. Uh, but of course, between the, the 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 inheritance mechanism and the privileges and the immunities the church had, like there was some significant success in this direction. I mean, the, the post-Carolingian church is by far the most striking, one of the most strikingly successful legacies of the Carolingian Empire. I mean, the, the connective fabric of, in fact, post-Carolingian Europe, culturally, spiritually, um, also in the way it fed still the military, like the, the idea of the warrior saint and the, still the the rightfulness of seigneurial rule that was now beginning to, as we'll see now, rebuilt from scratch, literally, what the Carolingians had not been able to, to fix, even at a regional level, as a stable state. However, there had been, uh, say, some um, officials that the Carolingians made an effort to um, invest of significant public authority to in fact, rule on behalf of the king. They couldn't be everywhere all the time, in spite of the frenetic military activity of, of the Carolingians. There were expeditions across Europe, back and forth every year, um, which definitely helped um, the uh, restoration later. And actually, the survival of, of public authority, like public authority n nominally always existed. I recently made a video about Robert of France, like the early Capetians and how... Um, none of these guys ever dreamt to say, okay, let's act as if there was no state, no no king, no, author no, no public authority. Everything, including the empire, of course, was salvaged as much as possible because it, it could delegate um, further power and sort of self-legitimize itself in, in, uh, in the process. Uh, these Carolingian officials were also the product, of course, of the previous Romano-Germanic administration. Right. And um, the, the typically Roman concept of the palatium, for example, like the idea of a permanent infrastructure, like the solid and you know unequivocally like the strong, it provided even properly with some strategic relevance of you know we we keep the the soldiers, the weapons there, that the king finances this guy. I mean, he you know at least fosters them and can intervene. So it, it it's something that. From Roman times, the vestige of that's why um, Charlemagne builds Aachen, right, as a as a city of stone, right, as a complex of you know palaces fundamentally that wouldn't even technically evolve into a real like into a metropolis. I mean, Aachen would have some marginal relevance aside from, in fact, the ideological, the symbolical one in the later Middle Ages. But that was essentially meant to be a copy of Rome, right, or a, a Rome of of the north in the north. Right, um, and it's a very ambitious ideological plan. There are the baths. There are like it's. It, it must be like Rome. There can't be anything else. Like I will not digress on this, but there is no other possible universal model for any of these peoples but Rome. Right, even in 10th century Anglo-Saxon England, to find certain kings calling themselves Basileioi, not even 
Imperatoris, but literally how we're doing Constantinople. Uh, you know, again, the Latin matrix is what remains unavoidable to so the, the Roman papal one, um, the center of it all. Uh, but the officials that are quite famous are the, the so-called Missi Dominici. So there is, uh, at a districtal level, a lay authority and an ecclesiastical authority. They have to check one another, have different roles, and, um, and represent royal authority there. Um, so this overlaps with the diocese uh, and the county uh, administratively, and and these two officials have, again, two levels operationally. Um, the, the, let's say the spheres of influence, also especially from a territorial point of view, will explode a little bit after post-Carolingian times, because normally the counts were still remaining this Frankish bias that were in the rural, encapsulated dimension, whereas the bishops run the city. In a also more long-lasting, um, you know, administrative continuity. So in the organization of the Frankish imperial domain, doesn't matter how the, the division in districts was uh, heterogeneous, right, and irregular, the counts uh, proposed to, to its control received the honor, so the honor, the office, uh, which tells you how endowed with that part of imperium it really was, because that's what the language is. This is not just like a, you know, materialistically, relativistically, bureaucratistic, statistic idea of, of of a state official like we have today. These guys were state officials because they were chosen by God to 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 have the faculty of killing. Essentially, like um, in as in the fallen mankind on in earthly government, um, the the counts were incredibly important in this sense to 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 sponsor and to to help the bishops because the clergymen could not shed blood in theory. Um, so they had different um, uh, justice uh, faculties, and or at least the the lay arm had to enforce these for for the clergy as well. Um, and so there was this district and uh, um, th this is an important step further to Merovingian times because technically the system had always worked. I mean the counties, the diocese had always overlapped but in Merovingian times there's still a migration era idea for which the Franks that have settled there are just more like a community, right? There are some sort of clan that has been has been settled like uh, through the hospitalities to essentially replace the the Roman military and to keep ruling the place as it had done. In Carolingian times, the system is much more hierarchical. I mean, the social certification has radically increased, and so these districts take on a sort of more, in fact, um, a permanent function, right? A, a much more deeply felt one at, at uh, also at the national level. All right, these districts are the the cornerstone of of the administration in the very way they connect with the with the king more more directly and personally because they these guys are now literally enveloped with this stuff like through the vassalatic beneficiary uh, mechanism evolved again from the older commendatio and all this stuff I talk about this in some video but. The important is that they are ever better defined. And especially when the Carolingian Empire fragments, it's literally the basis from which these now much more powerful guys, the much better defined ones at a kingdom level, have the faculty of rebuilding, like of protecting the population, of um, encapsulating, of, you know, and, and of course providing the troops for the royal expeditions when these at least were, you know, still enactable. Right. Um, there were also different groupings of districts. Sometimes, for example, the military, uh, say, frontiers were, generally speaking, entrusted to the marchioness that were essentially some 
noblemen but were entrusted with the command of different counties at the same time to have more concentrated uh, manpower under their direct rule and so being capable of, of acting more effectively uh, strategically on, on the frontier. Uh, they were more autonomous and sort of also more dangerous even to, to some extent. Um, they would give uh, receive uh, by, the, by the king full and uh, undivided powers with a delegation that included in fact all the public functions that were the ones around which everything revolved also in terms of money because essentially f from the exercise of justice you get the greatest amount of, of wealth you can um, properly give the local community a direction rather than another it's mostly all about land ownership controversies and this allows you to foster your own private clientele and whatever like who gets um, more power or not etc so it's, it's really very 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 important the, there is of course attached the responsibility of defense which is very like the the litmus test of whether you're an effective ruler or not so these guys were to abuse of their power but in, in mostly in function to the to the overall public one the one that was above them not much the, the local one because they, if they wanted to survive they had to be effective with what they had at disposal and it was a fierce competition among all these various noblemen uh, as we are seeing the exercise of justice you have as a count to preside over the traditional tribunal the malus and were different degrees of literacy um, in fact civil development across Europe in th this way Charlemagne needless to say was brutally impressed with the the civil advancement of, of the Longbird kingdom so that he also drew a, he, first of all he left everything working uh, as it was and even took the Longbird crown at au pair with with the Frankish one in within the the actual imperial crown is is connected with with Italy not not with um, with the Frankish king which is I think very eloquent regarding where the the, the say that the best um, governability, it's a sort of center of power, was was identified um, with. Um, so all in all, that the most important thing was maintaining public order, peace, safety, security, right, and which is the first. Um, it's the foundation without which any state can't exist. Um, together with the bishops that would be assimilated as we hinted at it to royal agents in the fulfilling of public functions and this would be particularly evident in Ottonian times where uh, especially in the Italic kingdom uh, the, the, the that was ruled from the city like if you gave these bishops also comital power so without entrusting too much power to the lay nobility would tend to inherit this title you could control like concentrate power very very functionally in these areas um, so of course the counts were quite mindful about their um, you know the, their military obligations contracted with the king because it's from these that the concession of their of, uh, of fiscal lands had occurred Right. If you, again, were not to control the military, justice, um, you could, you didn't, you wouldn't have the, the right to decentralizedly rule over these lands and to to have that office for yourself, and even hoping to have it becoming in inherit, um, you know, hereditary, which is something that from the ninth to the eleventh century was happening, right? With from the um, Capitulary of Kierzy sur Roise by by Charles the Bald to the to the to the one of um, the Capitulary Italicum of of uh, Conrad the Salian, right? That respectively affirmed the 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 inheritability of the smaller and larger fiefs. It's under sixes. Uh, 67, 1037, not that far away time, but say one in which all these public functions were being de facto subcontracted, right, to bargain power, right. Uh, 
with the with the king, the emperor as well. Um, so very relevant in all this was the income connected with the activity of government that consists in, in quotas of the royal fiscal rights and the pecuniary um, penalties inflic inflicted during the carrying out of the judiciary tasks that, as we said, uh, were to be paid to, to the count as essentially a re uh, as a recompensation for the service carried out. Because you have to spend money to to use your uh, your force, essentially, to enforce this justice, deterrent power, authority, etc. The count had the right of appointing directly his uh, agents, his uh, officials, especially the scabini that constituted the most direct connection in the exercise of public authority. Um, these were the fact of judges, right, that would eventually, you know, uh, act as, you know, judicial officials, etc. Um, together with the support of the count, again, the demand power, um, there was um, relentless work of verification, by the way, um, of the local customs, for example, the, the resolution of the controversies, mostly patrimonial ones, between the, um, you know, the privates, this this is relevant because, of course, at the time it was not a fully homogeneous control of the communities. Nobody had like a uniform, like sovereign control over the freemen. There was a this uh, a palpable again a divide between the, as we've seen, the universal ambitions of these powers within their territory and how eventually the communities would actually regulate themselves by their own customs and you know traditional organization so many changes in i don't know property in just the general uh, decline even if, for example in during the saint carolingian era of individual liberties um the say the the the, the increasing dependency of many people with the spread of the vassalatic beneficiary that is part of feudal system on the, the powerful would um, which was a mechanism triggered by the St. Carolingian conquest and sort of social engineering but was yes keep keeping things together on a stronger basis of sort of um, rendering it impossible for many people to defend their own rights as they had been before I made a video about this regarding for example the ecclesiastical power in the uh, of the churches in the italic kingdom during the ninth century that's quite eloquent but we'll be making others as well you witness um, with the establishment of true courts um, at a commental level the strengthening of the clientary connections and the the functionary pr prerogatives, right, um, in terms of loyalty of service in the vassalatic relation existing also between the king and, and his own officials, um, that were these noblemen at the end of the day, both originally and in as a consequence of the concession of the honor, right, the entire system was essentially basing itself on this prepaid military service entailed by the conferment of lands and communities and castles etc to, to to the guy at that point was the fact of in power locally uh, because he was backed of course by a superior authority that did have some power on him as, as as the king but that was it that in that after that I installation um, uh, in uh, you know locally quite difficult to dislodge and that's how eventually the Carolingian Empire that does fall apart not just for that it was a matter of motivation like essentially the reward um, for all the 
the military expeditions had brought to the conquest of all this new land that could be given, just that had acted as a decoy for, for these guys to go at war in the first place, and entering the, say, the, the, the royal clientels, risking their lives, just making the effort of arming themselves, etc. Um, so, in, in a first moment, the office was um, not the object of beneficiary concession, but of the good, say the properties connected with the retribution of the same, the so-called res de comitato, right? So what pertains eventually to to the comitatus, not the comitatus itself. In other words, the public authority there is ultimately the king's, right? The conferment of this of these lands is, is negotiated for what you have to give in exchange for that, but the, in theory, merely in theory, ideally, the, the, the local vassal does not have the, the right there to do whatever he wants with public authority. Like alienating public authority, say, to another state, will essentially say, no, that this thing does not exist anymore. No, he, he is there because he has to absolve this contract. Which remains technical throughout the entire mi- Middle Ages and beyond. I mean, it's a, that's how eventually all the various seigneuries, the, the nobility, like of the various fiefs, are gradually recompacted under ever more powerful nobility, and within the kingdoms there are ever more statal-like, right, etc. Through the modern age, um, only, in fact, in consequence of the transformation, especially during the collapse of the Carolingian Empire uh, of the Count. Uh, aside from the uh, functional uh, real qualification characteristic this this period um the vassalatic beneficiary interpretation of the same comital officium that is in many ways the inheritance of the same would have been conceived at least as a matter of real politic right and prevalently recruited among the great landowners, the Carolingian counts, could be noblemen, but uh, sometimes were just even very rich people, like even merchants at some point had been required to go to, uh, to war because, they, again, the, the Romano-Germanic laws functioned on the base of, of patrimony, right? And so these guys had maybe transformed themselves into a powerful comital class, but they were just, they had also more humble or just this this was not so well defined like in terms also of uh, nobility um like this is something that gets classified well and divided only in in the twelfth century right so initially at this point power is power fundamentally because everybody has to if you are armed and you can go at war and uh in this sense the imperium is manifested through you your sort of uh nobility. I mean, even technically, the Romano-Germanic free, uh, freemen, the later uh, communal citizens, were, in as much as they could bear arms, especially if they were able to rule without a superior authority, they were considered as noblemen, even if they were commoners, because that's how, again, the, both the Romans and the Germans act, had thought of themselves, in not in a... Um, rigidly categorical sense of you know social divide but in the possibility of elevating themselves and if they were ipso facto powerful enough uh, they were just um, incarnating embodying the imperial power conferred by god even through a hierarchy of the king of the emperor right but still as individuals that were worthy of you know bearing arms in that regard needless to say the late carolingian times witnessed the disarmament of a great part of the population, if anything, also to functionalize agricultural production and the efficiency of the of the military that had to protect them. There was ever more elite mounted, heavily armored, you know, sort of in fact the true military classes. It would emerge neatly in the tenth century. Um, the Carolingian counts thus become very rooted in their own jurisdiction uh, in the in the collapse of the empire in these jurisdictions in fact they had their own landed estates 
they um, essentially uh, maintained an ever more direct control in the relation with the, the local society. This had happened in part with some loss in power, right? Uh, at a like these were counts. Uh, actually, as we've said before, of course, the, their power had increased compared to Merovingian times. But I mean, um, a county could be also a, a relatively small thing, right? They weren't dominating a provincial dimension normally. It's just the the dukes, the the markings were, right? Um, in any case, there are counties that expand, meaning that once the counts of a place manage to, I don't know, rule over other four counties for some reason, this is typical of seigneurial Europe, so yes, in that case you have, I don't know, think about the county of Champagne becoming, I don't know, one of the most powerful ones in the kingdom of, of the Western Franks, but, you know, it's because in that sense the original district evolves into some sort of feudal seigneury rather than the original public district so do not confuse the two things it's just technically it's not even true that there was such a county uh, that there was just a sum of territories that were ruled by the house that were had been originally the counts of somewhere within, within this thing right so it is extremely important to distinguish it you know, from feudal um, from feudal times in later centuries um so the count was a big deal locally, right? He was the, the guy who had more powerful that reinforced the public office uh, through his own influence and vice versa, um, establishing his net of vassalatic relations, of family ties, dynastic connections with other counts, other, other noblemen. So at the peak of Carolingian power, Charlemagne, you could count something like hundreds of comitas, of counts, and a, mm, let's say, a, a, a group of some thousands of lesser functionaries, called variously like the Vicari, the Centenari, the Scabini, right? The Vicarius was sort of a vice count or something, or at least they, they could act on behalf of the count in that best. The centenari stemmed instead from the ancient, um, let's say, clanic repartitions, like the were guys that, that, that in theory were the heads of 100 people in the military expedition, these were sort of the local, the equivalent of the local clan leaders that now had sort of lost power compared to this higher nobility. The scabini that we, as we've seen, were um, essentially judges, say, literate, um, juridically educated people, right? They were all necessary for the administration of, of the community. Um, we have to cite to these also in the exercise of public authority, those agents that operated within the great uh, assets, the great estates of the ecclesiastical entities. Right, that provi were provided with immunity. That is, they were exempted from the count's jurisdiction. This was incredibly important because um, they. This tells you how powerful the church really was. These guys were normally called advocati. There was also a more generic term that could be found also in the lay world that was the ministerialis, which, however, we've seen it with the German. Uh, ones that are sort of the most famous because they evolved into the knightly class of Germany essentially but um, these were essentially non sometimes at least they were just lesser um, I mean administration comes from Latin which means ad minus so it means the, the the guy was deputed to the lesser things technically so these were also not noblemen often they could be even serfs right um, and in the ecclesiastical lands they were uh, that had their own immunity, their own their own prerogatives. They could um, essentially just operate at the episcopal discretion without the count actually having the the faculty of intervening. Right. The advocati were formally procurators of the title holders of the estates for the exercise of powers of public nature. 
um, because at some point the the bishops themselves are invested even with the, at least the the administration of some of the counties, right? Um, but the fact that sometimes they were considered by the kings and the emperors as indirect um, emanation of their own authority, right? This again could be layman as well in operating in lay context. For example, Louis de Pius talk about the advocati nostri, which means our own advocates, right? And so advocatus in Latin means that the guy was called to refer plausibly to to to, to, to carry out these functions, right? The, the people locally are to take the, the matters, uh, take the matter in their own hands, right? And it could happen at different levels. Some advocati were just against some sort of ministerialis local um, factota. Others were just, you know, true, like, I don't know, people of some status and some reputation that were sometimes used even as witnesses, as just, like, reinforcing uh, one side's point in judicial... Um, in the community, controversies, resolution, and stuff like that. Um, so, the patrimonial character of the Frankish kingdom brings to the inclusion among the royal functionaries also another type of official that is sort of even more generic in concept, that is the actor, plural actores which are specifically entrusted with the administration of the patrimony and fiscal lands. We're talking at this time in history of something like 600 ville, curtas and foreste, more than 100 palazzi, distributed across all the regions of the empire. Right? And this is in fact an enormous amount of public power, but also in fact, stretched across a very vast territory, um, witnessing, however, the establishment of something that in Merovingian times had not existed, right? There hadn't been even properly the need of the, for it to exist. The Merovingian Empire was smaller, and the resources available, not just for the Franks, but also for their enemies, were smaller. Carolingian times, things are different. Right, the the villa here is, you know, some broader um, estate right now, with a bit more of a non-military connotation. The the court is, is a bit more like the center of a more organized farming and maybe with some um, in, incipit of encastellation. Uh, the foresta is the obviously the forest. Um, the forests were sometimes not even properly woods, right? But they, they, um, this is uh, very famous, especially for, for the British audience. They know that you know the, the royal forests in Britain are sometimes just some moors or whatever. But they may have some advantages. Some there are precious resources uh, associated with it. Lakes uh, are very important. Uh, of course, the forest too, also for. For example, the pigs um, foraging, right? Um, also for collecting some fruits. Um, the beehives are very productive as well. So there are these. Um, this is part of Carolingian economy, like the diversification, the rationalization, also the agricultural production. It's a pretty messy times, but let's say if you consider what feudalism managed to do, like it started from this seniorial um, administration, the capacity of, again, controlling things more uniformly um, within this hierarchy um, from the top and organizing the local communities accordingly and having an ever more, again, functional exchange uh, with the internally but also externally, right? Plus, as we were saying before, the church had a massive importance in the political management of the empire. The uh, entire episcopal hierarchy was involved in the same, the rooting and the authority of the bishops within their own diocese in order to exercise public function was particularly 
uh, effective, right? In particular, probably the maintenance of internal peace of having like your own retinues there that can uh, police the city, can provide with also the, the garrisons for uh, the town watch, the uh, for repairing the walls. This, especially during the second invasions, becomes also on, on the bol- uh, say on the shoulders of the bishop right to uh, to to wake and the obvious reason being that the royal authority has collapsed in most of the realms and at least it it exists but it's it's much weak and sort of provincially based and so some big important cities have are are alone out there and they 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 create their own episcopal Seigneury that, in some cases, that takes over some offices of public security that uh, were pertaining theoretically to to the count, but that w- who had perhaps left the city, had started chasing other estates, had been encastellating himself in the countryside, had been doing other things, was not there, and the bishop takes over those functions. Um, so the already in Carolingian times the bishops were true and proper officials of imperial authority. There is a capitulary of Louis. The P is, however, um, going as far as qualifying the bishops as adutores of the king, so the king's helpers, some sort of counselors, right? As they they would have essentially become, like the, the ecclesiastical authorities, much more supportive of the monarchy, because they're tendentially a, a weaker uh, one as well. They, As we were saying, they need the advocati to exercise some functions of higher justice, at least materially combinating um, death sentences, for example. Um, so they tend to stick... Uh, around the king in order to back public authority as much as they can. And this happens pretty much in all the kingdoms, also in the non post carolingian ones. Um, and even before, of course, Carolingian times, this had been the case for everybody, right? The 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 gods, the, the Longbirds, the Franks, everybody had, the, the Anglo-Saxons, the, the Vandals, you name them. Of course, the ecclesiastical hierarchies had a power that went beyond the merely uh, say spiritual one they they were becoming de facto some true landlords it's the, the same is true also for abbots for eventually some monastic congregations etc they they own lots of land of of people of cattle right the and there is of course um, a reason why the counts and the bishops have to check one another, right? The royal legislation specifies this, because they are all very powerful. You may not know how this thing goes, right? It's, it, it gets out of hand, it can erode to privatistically, to um, like usurping royal prerogatives. So while it is true that in post carolingian times, uh, the public rights are sort of very much negotiated by the same kings, that even subcontract one for uh, for not for good but because it still was their own deal and in theory again they could call that all that property back like the the fact that this was becoming an er- an hereditary right uh, made it all more you know evidently difficult to recover and again it's not until the 19th century, that for the first time you have the state, uh, a truly absolute state, meaning that, that the state becomes the sole source of the law, and so everybody has to uniformly obey to the state, and not responding to any previous um, pre-existing right of sort. I mean, even the common law today technically does not allow any community to literally just do whatever they want. There is a limit within that is true also for German Federation. In the countries of civil law, and there are hybrids as a matter of fact, as we will make some video about this soon as well, um, you realize, of course, that the statal contractual power is much greater than ever because we have 
a much more peaceful um, uh, in spite of all in spite of what it seems to us in the fa fact because we are habituated to these standards an incredibly safer and stable society than ever right this comes historically from the fact the efforts of our ancestors in these contexts like I mean, think, imagine, if you can, living in a country, in a, in a, in a community, in, in a reality in which you do not know whether your rights can be safeguarded in, to, to the point of, again, of constant warfare, feuds, uh, violence. Um, this, to some extent, does exist, but um, it is at the time it was something much more much less exceptional, much less, uh, you know, just as a, as a form of, as a form of mentis, really. It was more like the mafia in general than, than, than a uniform, like, authority against which you don't put your, you can't say that, I don't know, the state is a racket, but let's be honest, like, the quality of life has skyrocketed as soon as we have a functional state, so it's just a hypocritical winery about this. And the entire civilization of Fort has been headed towards avoiding some sort of arbitrary judgment and some sort of more collectively mature through merits and standards that can be applied uniformly. Uh, and yes, legitimately, whether people like it or not. Because um, who cares about what dumb people don't like to some extent, right? In any case, um, uh, for how much the counts were in direct contact with the king through periodical assemblies of mostly military character, think about the field of May for the for the Franks, but in general, like I made some videos about the Western Frankish kingdom explaining how you can measure the uh, local royal power on the basis of how many counts would gather at these assemblies with their contingents, whatever, and observing that, in fact, the authority of the king in, in practice and concretely. And in fact, for this, the comital system would not ensure the um, constant indispensable coordination with the royal court and of capillary uniform spread of the royal orders for the, for the reasons that was just stated the fact that these powers were just privatized uh, subcontracted and so there was a, a great deal of discretion and autonomy in the way at some point like if, if the king was weak or there was nothing to get to gain for from uh, the participation to the expedition to actually go there and spending the all the, the efforts and the resources that could be maybe used to entrench further locally and becoming a, even more untouchable, right? So that's how, you see, the, the banal lordship, the law, they essentially formed themselves. I have a vast playlist uh, about seigneurial Europe, but also about the post carolingian when they sort of overlap, but they, they, they tell you exactly how uh, effectively even the same royal authority was now entrenching as a sort of lordship on its own in order to maintain itself. Again, the, the recent video made about Robert II is exactly that. This guy was essentially, like, as a Capetian, um, essentially a, a provincial um, prince, magnate, and landowner, and only additionally he was the Western Frankish kingdom and uh, king endowed with a public authority, a sacral mythology, and uh, etc. So, the real power was wielded at this level. Um, so, naturally, in parallel with this, and depending on the the power of the various vassals, there was, albeit not all over the empire, a thick net of other functionaries that. Um, as we've seen, was connected both with the lay and the ecclesiastical hierarchy. All right, the, the missi dominici being, as we've said before, like in theory, like the, the beginning of that. All right. Um, 
uh, they are the same counts, the same bishops, but um, they they also have a net of agents of of officials of of workers that control the system for them, right? And it is essentially a nucleus of stable government organization. Um, it, it, it even got, I mean, the, the Missy the Ministry were connected properly with the concept of the district, which was where the, it was the Missaticum itself. Um, and this was swinging in terms of the proportion of lay and ecclesiastical elements sometimes. For example, the Vassi Dominici of modest condition now would be substituted by prelates of a higher level. This was preferential. Um, uh, we, we've seen essentially that the, the, a missus could be even a count, a nobleman itself, but it was important to choose the milieu from which they came as well. I mean, in Charlemagne's times, there were some counts that were receiving this title just because they, they were even actually nobodies, but they had been so great uh, in, in battle that Charlemagne had recompensated them. It's like, uh, I don't know, a monarch trying to, to create its own loyal, not-so-powerful guys that, however, just because they have been appointed by him cannot quite be touched by the higher nobility that is always sort of anxious to rise to power to overthrow the, the ruler in some way. So the, the clergy is safer, as we've seen, to back the monarchy and the, the entire system. Um, they granted, for example, a greater authoritativeness that derived itself by the, say, the holiness of the ecclesiastical office, Yes, these times were pre-Gregorian, so the, say, the ecclesiastical discipline was pretty lax, but the Carolingians had carried out a massive reform, as you know, exactly to fix this problem in, before the Carolingians. Um, there were some priests, say, we, that didn't even literally understand Latin and could, wouldn't read the Bible, would make the sort of most ridiculous translations, even, you know, risking to... to to alter literally the theological content that, however, you know, there was no intention, no intellectual, again, interest even very much in the in the Frankish world, north of the Alps, to, uh, you know, to, to make it anything. In fact, Latin Germ Germanic Europe was also, not entirely actually, for this, thanks also the papal guidance, radically orthodox compared to the Byzantines during the early middle ages it, to an insane level, right, in comparison, like, this this Germanic Aryans, barely Christian, who essentially still um, believed in paganism to an extent, were incredibly more obedient to the orthodoxy, you know, defended by uh, the, the, the Roman popes against whatever the Byzantines were doing, Constantinople, to Equilibristically trying to to say that the Near Eastern provinces full of heretics and making compromises with that, um, which means a lot, telling the truth for the development of of the West. Now, the Missi net uh, was superimposed and intertwined with one of the counts, the the ecclesiastical hierarchy. They were often the same people and delineating a sort of more complex and capillary system that would represent the king and could exercise his powers within all the regions of the empire. The officers that carried out within the palatium functions of domestic character. All right, so these were palatine offices that were connected with the highest authority. Um, in these quite um, physical examples of, you know, of their temporal power. Um, one of those, for example, was the seneschal, literally the, comes from Latin, it means essentially the senior officer, right, the head of the personnel of the royal house, right. Then the butler, the camerarius, the 
Comes Stabuli, so literally the see all originating from some uh, this this latter case is quite say lower function like the butler from literally the bottle right and the, the guy who would control part and then say of the, like the you know the individual the personal needs of the of the ruler as much as the camerarius that has to deal with the initially like just the um, we want the wardrobe but eventually the probably the finances that well the commas stable the constable the guy who would check the stable and manage it for for the for the ruler so um, this were all offices you see pri privately conceived um, in relation to the domus the house of, of the ruler this figures existed also at the lower level among the the noblemen right they had similar functions just they had not been categorized and institutionalized as such um, and so for the king we understand these functions in an extensive way I mean the the offices implied formally um, the as we've seen like a, the personal service at the table uh, of the ruler in his bedroom in his um, stables but they the fact that had evolved already in the administration of the entire royal patrimony management of the revenues of the fiscal lands the organization of the armed retinue of the king so quite big stuff especially Carolingian times you can imagine like the the enormity of again of, of say administrative organizational or logistical issues connected just with the movement of the court right most of this was decentralized and that's why in fact these offices as we've seen are all scattered where I don't know what are in the palaces uh, but this in entailed also hierarchy within the same and so on then the word those um, offices that were not related to domestic functions right so the vassals are essentially in a generic sense the the guys that for just their different level of familiarity and personal service for for the king right uh, were exempted say for offices of higher responsibility in here and the organization of the court um, whereas the palatine offices uh, was the superintendence of a essentially personal was was seen as a personal personal patrimony of the king that had the size that we remembered before it was right imperial wide in Carolingian times and then it was necessarily used by the ruler just to move just to most of this was decentralized already but just the king could reach it also with significant forces to just uh, own it to control it much easier right there was an incredibly effective logistical system within the Carolingian Empire that was connected, in fact, with the larger amount of horses in the armies, like the all the the collection of the resources just to forage them and to to allow the army to pass speedily to cross these territories quite um, quite efficiently, all right? So, consequently, think about the Carolingian court and how complex this was, how beyond any sort of domestic household scale this already was right in fact this in comparison to i don't know the, the actual who's carls the the men of the house of you know the, the norse leaders and, and whatever where again similar functions but a scale is something else so this had changed a lot from merovingian times indeed but when already naturally something more developed had been existing i mean that the mayor of 
the palace was essentially the, the guy who had similar functions to the one of the seneschal. All right. An important aspect of this, say, Carolingian and post uh, immediately post Carolingian system is that, in spite of the general tendency to homogenization, the various levels of the hierarchy, etc., there is not such a thing yet like a, let's say, unitary structure of the functionaries' apparatus, right? Even when you look at the connections between the, um, say, the the central offices and the peripheral agents, there is no such thing like an organic relation between the center and the periphery. But in many ways, like um, the system has yet to evolve in sort of much more hierarchical way during, like for example, the, probably the full feudal times in the later centuries. And so the connections are, and I think it emerged a bit from the, the all the various overlappings that we have discussed earlier are sort of very um, horizontal in some way. I mean, they tend, they are vertical, they have never been as hierarchical as before, um, like in the Romano-Germanic world as before, but um, the, um, the the connections are still, and especially ever more during the fragmentation of the Carolingian kingdom, much more sort of parceled and sort of distancing even at a political level from one another, right, territorial. Um, so the central, you can so say, royal structures were uh, in many ways intertwined, not just with the, simply the, the king's retinue, right, but there was also vast as undifferenced um, nucleus of fidelis and counselors and offices that were destined to the coordination and administration of the household and the properties of the king that um, were, as we've seen, similar to the ones of the higher noblemen as the monarchy was sort of shrinking in actual authority and power. Um, so they were also pretty pretty similar, like the, the royal ones, as I just said, were not even that radically different, say, in the 10th century from the one of the the, the rest uh, of the main princes, the high nobility, let's say. And even what constituted, in fact, nobility was much more, uh, you know, uh, floating. Sometimes even the same ducal or marginal titles were alternated with the comital one, because at some point you were appointed for this, I don't know, frontier military task, but then you may have been demoted or the situation had changed and you went back to the, a simple com comital power, even though maybe you had been gathering some other, you know, say consensus power in other areas from which you would evolve into uh, some greater scenery, and so it's, it's that messed up. We've seen it many times uh, on the channel. Um, there were other offices that were administering the, the reign as a wall, right? Um, there were other figures, like, for example, the Palatine Counts that were proposed to the judiciary affairs of the single kingdoms, in which eventually the, the Carolingian Empire is, is going to be split, right, after especially Louis the Pius. Um, you have uh, the arch chaplain that was responsible for the religious services of the royal chapel, but that was, for example, very, very influent in the appointment of the bishops and had sort of an ecclesiastical realm to, to manage on, on his own, even beyond sometimes the royal control. Um, we've seen the advocati for the ecclesiastical entities and so all this very complex activity connected with the transmission of the royal will through a written documentation which is the other big chapter of the story and studying Carolingian documents is fascinating indeed they, in, in, in some ways they are primitive but they do show like a pretty big system that you realize that even though again they are old sources there aren't many etc it was something m much bigger behind it in terms of say, some sort of bureaucracy, of course, very rudimentary, 
ways, but the administration, the, the actual tasking of the individual officials with prerogatives that were, for example, also very similar to at least the the, the dedication that had stood behind the Roman administration and that the Carolingians wanted to restore, right? It was just 300 years before it was that the Romans ruled uh, these lands. So it, it makes you think in a historical perspective. Um, there was a Carolingian chancery for that matter. This depended on the chapel, um, and this we can't say was the real nucleus of the imperial government. Uh, its functionaries and scribes were the most authentic depositories of the notion of public mm, power. They were also the, the most educated individuals, at least the you know, at the Carolingian court there were many men of letters, etc., that had a also tendentially political role in, um, in fact, being connected clientrally with these other figures, uh, expressing the, let's say, the, the ideological uh, picture that the, the same empire required, but uh, stressing this or, or, or that. Um, concept or belief to, um, to 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 make political gain about that but how far the prerogatives um, of the king went to one of the church for example is a very important side of the story and it is indeed the church that maintains most of what was the had been the, the Roman um, administrative governmental legacy right the idea is um, that surely the, the, the clergy was more educated, that the connection with Rome had, and also the, after the conquest of Italy by the side of the Franks, had sort of been always the greatest source of higher education, culture, and uh, general, uh, you know, tradition, past also the notions of imperial authority. They had the most educated personnel, they had sort of the more classical ph philological education they also had uh, like just the church had been organized in sort of a more coherent way historically um, on the basis of the cities the dioceses the, 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 the centers of the greater um, uh, education like so it's it's really very um, um, you know in the Latin Germanic uh, Synthesis here should be really stressed how much the Carolingians themselves drew from from Rome, from the Roman world, the, the most um, Romanized and also civil part of their kingdom. That those notions that we see at the root of the Carolingian Church and its survival, as we've seen, um, that the same ecclesiastical reform, the uniformation of the script, was crucial for communication. Like so many different. Say, uh, it's really a, st a great leap forward in the concept of of a European Union, right? In the idea that all these nations had sort of re re um, gathered together under a single Roman imperial rule. This is incredibly important in in the Renovatio Imperii, in the Carolingians, in the Ottonians, in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and this had been managed, even in, imperfectly and still rudimentarily, and, um, with, with that sort of pinch of Frankish brutality that was just inescapable, even an advantage, like in, for example, in the warlikeness of this, the will and of, to power of this, of this force. Um, what really reopened. Um, the Latin Germanic world to the idea that they were really at the center of a true imperium on their own. This is incredibly crucial, I would say. And the church, again, uh, would keep safeguarding this, even in the moments of greatest weakness of the uh, of the public authority, of the kings, of the emperors. Uh, so as we were saying in the quite changed situation of the empire the, at the end of the 9th century with the extinction of the Carolingian 
dynasty on the throne, uh, on the imperial throne, the, the, the military pressure coming from the external as a consequence of the fragmentation of royal authority and the ever lesser capacity of uh, governmental intervention in the defense of the local realities and communities. There was a, this profound transformation that we have already outlined that, that marked the end of the probably the Carolingian organization, this great ambitious um, and energic effort by the side again of some very strong headed figures. Um, together with also the disappearance of certain characters that can be def defined even though in, pe in the peculiar ways with it some sort of public function right at least there are public prerogatives that are held now by a power that is much more private in nature but that absolutely does not forget this duality as we have observed all the ambiguity existing between this public power sharing and the vassalatic beneficiary relations introduced within uh, the fact that the same rapport between the kings and the counts beyond the same concept the original concept of the honor right um, as we've seen this was just like a honor granted by the king as the ideally overlord and controller of literally the entire territory. Like say if you had asked Clovis uh, that the Frankish kingdom belonged to him as a personal private possession. Right? And so different again if you had asked Theodoric probably he would have thought the same from his Germanic background but would have been acquainted with the sort of much more I don't know public nature that the Roman administration had in Italy in that he wanted to safeguard himself for uh, aggrandizing you know his own his own power internationally um, at this point instead the honor had become sort of an object of content of some sort it, it became it was negotiated as we've seen it became hereditary together with the other beneficia right it was given a value while theoretically initially it was absolute in value or at least absolute as much as you know that's an interesting reflection as long as you know of course the universal empire still existed but at least it, it had been fragmented in the hands of different kingdoms um, and thus also within the same you could give a price to that if you gave a price to to the world to to humanity in any case in very concrete terms um, these elements transform essentially the, the power exercised by the counts on behalf and in the name of the king in a sort of preeminence of personal and familiar character. It's essentially what we know in feudalism and say what in fact sort of developed further later with the growth of Europe from this sort of more fragmented and unevenly distributed wealth that had to eventually regrow to, to reestablish a true sense of public uh, absoluteness of some sort. The same lay missy that were ever more frequently um, recruited from within the local aristocracy and gradually invested also of tasks of military organization, so de facto becoming feudalized themselves and sort of aristocracy in a, say in a, in a, in a class sense, um, followed the, fact, the pattern of the counts as far as the routing of the governmental districts and the patrimonialization of the office and the lands, the assets were concerned. In other words, again, this is the moment in which more or less all the other estates sort of go under and the, the military one, the, uh, the lay one, and in parallel with the church, the ecclesiastical the hierarchy become ever more detached from the rest. Um, they control it, like, and they do it effectively. This also stems from like a voluntary concession of this power by the side of the peasantry, the, the communities in general, 
it's not that they weren't powerful, it's just that the wall um, system that it was much more powerful before was, was not there anymore. In other words, by the, to between the 9th and the 10th, um, some say the 10th, the 11th, it depends on what you're looking at, but let's say the, the public organization of power marked a sensible regression. I, at least in Carolingian times, this had been sort of even out there, and already from the end of the 9th century, you see the, the collapse um, due to the essentially private nature of public authority, the Carolingians. It sounds uh, strange, but it really is like seeing this public authority is what makes and force it. But the Franks are culturally very, very private. So what you see in the 10th to 11th century is the 10th is definitely the moment of lowest um, power of public authority. From the 11th you see, if anything, like this authority rising. So even if it's not conceptually power, say, uh, public, it is at least more concrete. All right? And many kingdoms begin to reassert part of this, the same public authority on a private basis, but being recognized as, as the world. We've seen it again in that recent video about Robert II as an example among the main. Uh, and there is a general trend towards this direction. And eight, again, lots of videos about the feudal monarchies, the 10th to 11th centuries. It's a moment of recomposition in many ways, of restabilization of, of the system. Um, there was surely in these centuries also a demarcation like a difference between the subjects provided by uh, with powers of public character as kings of, of uh, officials and those who instead were exercising them on the basis of patrimonial and military um, preeminences this difference essentially uh, disappears because if you have these public authorities, it's in many ways because you have been able to acquire them, to purchase them, to, to usurp them, and to have them finally recognized in the de facto balance of, of the kingdom by saying kings in exchange for the recognition of the same mark. That's why, again, public authority never dies um, at the end of the day. Um, it was convenient to, for everyone to have a king or an emperor formally. Important was him not to be too powerful. All right? But as long as he could delegate your own power, you could build locally this power. And paradoxically, that's how this power would be co-opted, compacted ever more until they sort of, towards the end of the Middle Ages, would come to overlap with the same concept of modern state of a more unitary, homogeneously administered and governed. Um, kingdom of course for, for some places it's just a long way to go right but that's how during the ancien regime the early modern centuries things kept evolving after all towards a more absolute direction um, but it's in the Carolingian functionaries however that it's important to mm, say identify and recognize the roots of that European establishment that in the central centers of the Middle Ages would uh, remain, uh, say, would develop, right? At the, so the Carolingian connection, as we were saying before, even in a unitary sense for Western Christian dominion, in a general sense, is, uh, is crucial. The connection of the empire and the papacy, it's all there, right? So in many ways, it's just like the system consolidating it even overflowing beyond its uh, historical boundaries. The seigneurial preeminences had often their own origin in the memory, or the, even in the presumed one, the made-up one sometimes. We were talking about it just the other day for the Daromano of, of its Ezzelin the, the third. Um, that the Comital dynasties maintained of the originally public nature of their office and power that had been sort of delegated by the emperor himself and so by God so that on such memory that was preserved in the comital title like the, also even the one that had 
eventually sub being subcontracted, for example, the vice committal one. Right, the idea that even if maybe you were just a ministerialist that at some point uh, had been entrusted by his own lord, the the rule of a castle, and as a vice count, and that maybe the, the lord had died and you had become de facto just a, a count of the place, still that imperium had been delegated by the originally public authority and by God in, in a greater extent. So it was incredibly important. This hierarchy was affirmed as an establishment in the recognition right, of this level of power, of prerogative, uh, that level of effect of, of society. Um, the same went in part for the descendants of, the fun of other functionaries that founded the authority that they exercised on the areas of the originary public district in which they could prevail on the concurrence of the, the, the other lords, the other domini that had been spreading sometimes in very autonomously and newly originally and unchecked during the 10th century, right around, that had, in that sense, taken over functions of public character, so that there would be somebody who said, but look, we are the actual heirs of that, those who um, originally controlled it. These guys have sort of usurped this. Um, it would continue. Like, look at the communes, what they do with episcopal power, and the, in fact, the comital and ecclesiastical power at the same time, and they extend. I mean, it was the comital one from Antonian times, of bishop counts, but they extend um, their own power on behalf of the bishop that is submitted to them at that point, which is kind of rich and, and uh, clever in that orientation. Um, and this had, uh, in fact, taken on the character. I mean, this I made multiple videos about this, this um, de facto rule, uh, also the exercise. The, concretized in the capacity of exercising higher justice over, again, districts that originally did not belong to you, but that you had sort of become the lord of, because you were the only one capable of defending. And that the local communities, this was always the, the, the delegation in le legal terms, had entrusted you with, so that if the king had not been strong enough to be there to defend it, uh, you did, and this meant that you had sort of by divine nature acquired this sort of authority. And if you could not be dislodged, you can even ask for a loyal recognition of some of your power, which means that probably not even the king in theory could touch it, ever, because at that point, it, it, that's the measure of the sort of the territorial entrenching of these prerogatives. Right? It's, it's really insane, if you think about that, it's talks about a, a very degenerated public control, but still, the communities had managed to make it work in one way or another. Besides, there were those greater, um, let's say, ter mm, authorities, like on larger, and actually very va vast, often, territorial uh, extension, uh, that derived from those higher... Uh, titles and offices such as uh, the, the, as we've seen the ducal or the marginal ones which had historically managed to gather just greater power this is not to say that even these um, provincial rulers wouldn't suffer of the same problem the kings had to have so the disgregation because of their lo local vassals but they had sort of a more compact um sort of thus more easily controllable dimension that if they had managed to concentrate enough power in since the beginning from the advantage compared to the average count would have as they did develop uh, often quite consistent powers principalities fundamentally so especially in France and Germany uh, next to signories of comital origin, you have this vast principalities, the dimensions and the capacities of, of which um, 
guarantee that the exercise of some public powers, like the most of, um, from the, the side of the title holder, and that thus also confer the, the basis for some more stable political organism. Right. This is really important. In France and in Germany it happens in different ways. Like in France you have um, many more resources concentrated and so these the states would evolve in fact much more you know just like France overall uh, compared to Germany to a much more compact state because France was sort of the most disgregated kingdom at the beginning exactly because it had more power locally that could be usurped but then this was also glue that would compact more you know more power in Germany this Dutch is um, derived from the original ethnic repartitions of the migration era. By the Carolingian era, they were already in the hands of powerful oligarchies. Um, that, in fact, um, um, were, let's say, mm, not so powerful as, as the Western Frankish one, and for this reason would still elect more functionally, like. Germany would elect more functionally a, a ruler uh, as a king and even emperor before the French, but that wouldn't survive integrally f feudalization, which sort of these territories parceled in much more dynastic ways and eventually aborted the same German national monarchy compared, say, to England or to France that had this Western Frankish mold instead. And it's very important to stress. Um, so in this um, in this places you could see, of course, the genesis of new governmental apparatuses made multiple videos, say on 11th, 12th century France, Germany. We will keep seeing this a bit more in depth. Um, and in this frame, we have to contextualize and consider, especially those forms of seigneurial functionaries that allowed at that point the dukes and the counts to exercise directly their patrimonial authority. It would evolve gradually, mostly from, say, they had always existed, again, following the Carolingian pattern to a degree, on a smaller scale compared to the royal one, right? Um, you have this shipwreck of public system, uh, the public system in the 10th and the 11th century, in which the say tasks of administration and government had uh, concentrated within the seigneurial domain of both the princes and the kings, at least those princes that were incidentally also kings. Um, so this is interesting because wherever there is a king, you you have a continuity in part also from the same Carolingian offices. Right, those had never quite died. So I mean, if it's about the Ile de France, historically, for how many centuries this, in spite of the itinerancy of the court, etc., how the, the, this thing had sort of survived, modeled, reorganized. I mean, even the Byzantines had some, as you know, offices that dated back to late Roman times and that sort of transformed and changed function completely or whatever like here up after all in west everything was sort of more organic um, in, in um in the broader mold which is also because mm, let's say that the, there wasn't such a centralized rule that would simply reflect the changes of the entire empire like in the byzantine case at the court of constantinople Again, Western Europe was all pretty much similar, especially within the confines of post Carolingian Europe. Um, here you have, by the way, the rise of, especially during the 10th, 11th century, of the ministeriales that had again already existed. They existed since Roman times, in Merovingian times, etc. Ministeriales from ministerium that were vassals often of uh, 
especially in Germany, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, of originary servile condition. So people who were not entitled to inherit their offices, and so that you could trust, right? Um, but that, um, in virtue exactly of, of this mechanism, were invested of such vast um, and remunerative tasks to become themselves some powerful landowners and military leaders, right? This is especially true again for the ministerialis in Germany. They have all an origin. There was a time in which they were also just very, you know, sort of civil in their functions. But Germany was pretty messy, pretty militarized, at least in the because of the constant turbulences and instability. There was some lesser social divide, and so these guys emerge even in a much more military character. And by the 12th, the 13th, I mean they're, they're really powerful, right? And in fact, they. So at some point they disappear because they are just like the other knights, so the juridical distinction of serfs sort of ended entirely. By the way, uh, in the 11th century we find patrimonial officers of the king in all the areas uh, in which in fact the monarchy could found itself, especially on the uh, solid as landed uh, property, right, and uh, maintaining the control of goods um, uh, and rights of public origin, right? If you look at, the, you know, the public domain is often sort of, at this point, a personal property of the kings, de facto, right? The, when a dynasty is substituted by another, of course, this takes over at that point the public demand but the fact that this land is not that different in nature from the one of the other princes owned by them and very often also being of public origin itself but being negotiated in different ways of just again the, if you were the king incidentally again your your property would have had a, a greater importance but it, th this doesn't mean that it would be enough um, for you know you to be just stronger than your own vassals like in the case of the Capetians compared to, to the Angevins for a long time for example but of course public demand plus controlled by the king in this sort of principality of his was just consolidating eventually so much prestige that is the same basis from which in fact this kingdoms developed but um, it depends also on which it is because just France is, like, again, every country is, I mean, France is more um, sort of ex exemplificative, both because of the continuity with the center of Carolingian power back in the day, geographically, and because it would become the, the most, I mean, the greatest, yeah. most powerful monarchy out there. Uh, but this existed also in the other countries, like, for example, this officials that we just mentioned were the sheriffs of England, the Merinos and the Adelantados in Castile, the Batles in Catalonia, the Prevosti in um, in Fra in other parts of France. So this is uh, that were used by the same kings, in fact, but also stemming from different um, traditions that were starting to affirm themselves, especially in the 12th, 13th century, which was the Say later the 13th, especially the bourgeois. And so, the, the, at that point, the real establishment of something more statal in direction that was not just about the, indiv the private power of the nobility, like in this older Frankish reality. And paradoxically, France is in fact the one that becomes more of a state, even after being the, the thickest forest, as we've seen on this private entrenching they, they it was the country that sort of um reflected the more on, uh, the most on, on this uh, previous limits of like uh, trying to surpass again the 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 primo uh, the actually all the ma uh, the equally split male inheritance this sense of you know 
again, uh, personal possession of and no other public logic behind that, right? Which is something, in fact, that was afflicting other kingdoms at this point, right? This is very uh, fascinating because you can't see how the state sort of reemerged paradoxically from some sort of feudal glue. So where this w had been the strongest, it, it allowed for the surpassing of the same, right? And um, in other countries, instead, sort of failed in late in the late Middle Ages, in the early modern age, in as much as they did not confer enough power to to the monarch, and they were taken over by others. By the way, so uh, they were failed states, never so that development that probably Western Europe narrowly meant would have, right? So the officials that we mentioned were also very multitasking. I mean, they could be used for different purposes. Um, normally, their office was subcontracted. Um, this, um, you know, it brought because it, and it would make a lot of sense because this allowed them to administer the revenues of the landed seigneury, so making a lot of money personally out of that. Um, but they also regulated the sort of legal life of the communities. Uh, now, today we we stop to the 11th century, so we don't go into the 12th and the 13th, but there's, of course, um, a rivalry, as we've seen, between the, the nobility and the officials, um, because they were just now something else that was trying to take them over, as it had been attempted, as we've seen with Longobards Gastaldi or with the Carolingian Missi Dominici. However, this have, would have had to be working, uh, ideally. Um, um, so these people could be more or less vassals of the king and, and of the and or of the local prince, because some very updated states like the Duchy of Burgundy, we've seen it in the video about the regional series, would be quite advanced in administration. Um, they would belong generally, at least in the early age, to the lesser um, to the local lesser aristocracy and sometimes such as in the case of the bailiffs of the duchy of Normandy they would represent a coherent and organic net that granted that allowed the presence of the princely authority on the territory starting from the control on the land on the men uh, carried out through um, agents that pretty much everywhere, like, um, you know, that allowed kings and princes to preserve or to acquire um, goods or rights or reacquiring them. Um, and that hand as a mechanism to, of course, reconstitute itself on the capacity of e exercising an authority of public character were a territory that was not just limited over the direct seigneurial dominion, but in fact recovering the greater circumscription, like the, the broader district, that at the end of the day the, the kingdom was, and ideally also the empire had to be, because the Holy Roman Emperor in theory was, was to rule beyond what we have seen just as essentially Germany, Italy, Bohemia, Burgundy, like it, in theory they should have exerted power in this public concept all over, at least Western Christendom, at least all over the world in practice. Um, and so this this is all a path that in fact develops together with a certain mentality, certain national roles. I made multiple videos about the, the ideology of Holy Roman emperors in this uh, relation also with the monarchies for the 12th, 13th century. I have made really plenty of content in this regard, so we will keep coming back on this as it's a very um, relevant uh, topic. It's a very relevant... Um, you know, it never ends. Like it, This is the history of power wielding and the, the, the balance that lays behind it and it's extremely instructive to
sort of show historically the trend of it, which is at this point hardly uh, heading obviously towards something um, deteriorating. I mean, there can be excesses in the balance of power, but generally speaking, this I mean, human communities have the capacity of balancing themselves out. There is some spark there for improvement, and this is with very hard work, as this history proves, by the way, how think about all these events, the, the general problems, the instability, the difficulties, but they, they managed to make it work. Which, uh, at, this, at a core institutional, political and social, juridical level is, is completely un, unshowed, like in uh, pop culture. Search any um, content in the Middle Ages, Nobody talks about these dynamics. It's either something, ah, oh, how was like the medieval life and of a peasant, or uh, what happened in medieval taverns? Like, I mean, what kind of moron sort of concerns himself after just once or twice of, of these things when you have to understand how the system worked, like in this broader fashion that these. Also, the lesser people were requiring like the the complete idea of a, of a civic education of a public authority is completely absent. They're just people bred in like animals into a world that has, that gives them everything without deserving it, and um, ignoring that history shows you the reason and, and why you should be grateful and actually working and improving yourself further for it but there isn't like this sense of wanting to to accept that there must be uh, an order given by people with greater vision like the rulers were at the time uh, and that you're just entrusting power to somebody else because you're ex implicitly admitting to be too weak at least it's everyday life it's literally what happens in your life right now so if you're never concerned yourself with it, there's going to be a severe problem with your exist the rest of your existence as long as it continues and depending on you know how old you are at this point in your life. Right? Um so we'll see in other videos of course, but I already made some videos about this actually. How the essentially um reconstruction of the public institutions of the reigns had new further and essentially decisive development uh, especially of the functionaries um, and how they they operated and sort of like the states that were born at the time in many ways were in spite of radical essential concepts uh, like essentially the, the same ones politically and territorially that we see today in Europe at large um so it's um again it's a lot of stuff you know, there is always a lot to say and it's important to cover these institutional aspects as well because otherwise it would seem nothing sort of makes sense or it's all pretty foggy how did it happen how did they rule i think these are actually the most important things and if again if you do not ask yourself about it there may be something wrong properly in the way you, you see not just history but you know politics and war and society like it will be completely meaningless if not studied at this level which is again what I presume most adults skip entirely like in their worldview but anyway um, for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content um, as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time